But then I want to, <clears throat> we're going to be taking a passage out of uh, Numbers 26 for our text, but I want to read a few sections out of the book of Numbers. Uh, so if we turn to the very first uh, chapter of the book of Numbers, we'll read verses 1 through 3, and then 45 and 46. We'll turn to chapter 25 and read the first nine verses, and then to chapter 26 where we'll read two sections as well. So if you just uh, follow on, uh, we'll eventually get to the text in chapter 26. Let's begin in Numbers chapter 1, and uh, with the verses 1 through 3. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names every male by their poles from 20 years old and upward all that are able to go to go forth to war in Israel thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies then we skip over to verses 45 46 so were all those that were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers from 20 years old and upward, all that were able to go forth to war in Israel. Even all they that were numbered were 600,000 and 3,550. And then turning over to chapter 25, we read the first nine verses of that chapter. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. The people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the, unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every, man, every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel and those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. And then we turn to chapter 26 and we're going to begin at verse 1, read to verse 4 and then we'll begin again at 51. Verse 1 of 26, And it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, saying, Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from twenty years old and upward throughout their father's house, all that are able to go to war in Israel. And Moses and Eleazar the priest spake with them in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Take the sum of the people from twenty years old and upward as the Lord commanded Moses and the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt. And over to verse 51. Uh, these were the numbered of the children of Israel, 600,000 and 1,730. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, and to few thou shalt give the less inheritance. To every one shall his inheritance be given according to those that were numbered of him. Notwithstanding the land shall be divided by lot, according to the names of the tribes of their fathers they shall inherit. According to the lot shall the possession thereof be divided among between many and few. And these are they that were numbered of the Levites after their families, of Gershon, the family of the Gershonites, of Kohath, the family of the Kohathites, and the Merari, the family of the Merarites. These are the families of the Levites, the family of the Libnites, the family of the Hebronites, the family of the Marlites, 
the family of Mushites, the family of the uh, Kurathites, and Kohath begat Amram. The name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt. And she bare unto Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam their sister. And unto Aaron was born Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord. And those that were numbered of them were twenty and three, uh, twenty and three thousand, all males from a month old and upward, for they were not numbered among the children of Israel, because there was no inheritance given them among the children of Israel. And here begins our text uh, then for this evening. These are they that were numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. But among these there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness, and there was not left of them, uh, not a man left of them, save Caleb uh, the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So it's those last uh, three verses of Numbers 26 that we are focusing upon uh, this evening. On the plains of Moab, uh, the Lord executed judgment on 24,000 sons of Israel. The deaths of those 24,000 on account of their physical and spiritual fornication brought to an end the judgment of the Lord upon the children of Israel, a judgment that flowed from the children of Israel's refusal some 39 years earlier to go up and take possession of the land of Canaan. You might recall that at that time, the children of Israel had embraced the report of the ten spies and rejected the report, the more favourable report of Joshua and Caleb. As a consequence, the Lord determined that that unbelieving and disobedient generation would never enter into the promised land. The judgment of the Lord is recorded in Numbers 14 and verse 30. And the Lord's judgment was this, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. God's judgment upon that generation was executed over the next 39 years, during which time the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. The judgment of God having been executed upon that rebellious generation, uh, here in Numbers chapter 26, as part of the final preparation for the children of Israel to enter into the land of Canaan, uh, the Lord instructs Moses and Eleazar, the high priest, to conduct a census or a numbering of the people. Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward throughout their father's house, all that are able to go to war in Israel. Uh, though this census was concerned with the numbering of those men who were able to fight, and those men aged 20 years of old age and upwards, the purpose of the census was not designed primarily to assess the military strength of the children of Israel. Rather, the purpose of the census was to make a record of the ancestral lines of the children of Israel and hence the tribes and families of every individual male among the children of Israel aged 20 years of age and upwards. Now, this information was required in order to divide the promised land among the tribes of Israel. Each of the 12 tribes, save for the tribe of Levi, was to receive a parcel of land in Canaan. Each tribe was then to divide that parcel of land among the families within the tribe. And this was their God-given inheritance and appointed, in fact, to a family's interest, ultimately in the heavenly Canaan. The census was necessary because the distribution of the land was to be based on the size of the different tribes. The tribes with greater numbers were to receive a greater portion 
of the land. Now, significantly, the census undertaken here in Numbers 26, which was undertaken on the plains of Moab, this was the second census of the children of Israel following their exodus from Egypt. The first census, which we read of in Numbers chapter 1, was undertaken by Moses and Aaron. Now, that census had been undertaken some 39 years earlier at Mount Sinai, uh, shortly prior to the children of Israel's refusal to go up and take possession of the land of Canaan. And in that census, the total number of able-bodied men aged 20 years of age and upwards uh, was total, totaled some 603,550. 603,550. In this second census, undertaken by Moses and Eliezer upon the plains of Moab, the total number of able-bodied men uh, totaled some 601,730. And so if you do the maths, you'll discover that the uh, numbers differ by some 1,820. Now, while those figures in themselves are interesting, and a great discrepancy between the figures, uh, while those uh, figures are interesting, there's something that is quite astounding uh, that should not actually escape our attention. Now, though the number of able-bodied men 20 years of age and upwards remained almost the same, we are told that in the second census there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. There was not a man of them that was numbered by Moses and Aaron that were numbered in this second census on the plains of Moab. In other words, not one of the men numbered in that census taken 39 years earlier was counted in this second census, save for Joshua and Caleb. What that meant was that over 600,000 able-bodied men, not to mention women and children, had perished in the wilderness. Indeed, the whole of that unbelieving generation, save for Joshua and Caleb, had died in the wilderness. Now that is sobering. And it's a word that should speak powerfully to us who are members of the visible church. So let's look at that word of God then this afternoon under this theme, the next generation. Uh, I divide the sermon under these three headings. Firstly, a just exclusion. Secondly, a faithful God. And finally, a purified church. The second census conducted by Moses and Eliezer there on the plains of Moab revealed that an entire generation of the children of Israel had perished in the wilderness. Out of that first census taken at Sinai some 39 years before, there was not a single man whose name was included in the second census. Every last man that had been included in that first census at Sinai had died the only exceptions being Joshua and Caleb. All that previous uh, unbelieving generation failed to receive an inheritance or interest in the promised land. This was the judgment of the Lord against that generation, as we read in Hebrews chapter 3 and verses 10 and 11. There we read, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. What should also not be overlooked is that not only did that whole generation fail to enter into and receive an inheritance in the promised land, but that at that first census, that whole generation were all numbered among the children of Israel. That's significant. That whole generation were actually all numbered among the children of Israel. In other words, they're all identified as being members of the nation of Israel. They're all identified as being the covenant part of the covenant people of God. Every last one of those 600,000 plus men belong to the covenant people of God. 
and you could put it in this way, they're all numbered as being part of the visible church of God of that day. It would be as though we conducted a census of our congregation. Uh, if we were to conduct a census of our congregation, we'd have a, a list of names and each name would be identified as belonging uh, to the EPC Launceston congregation. And each name would be identified as having a place or a part within this part of the visible church of God. As such, uh, those counted in the first census uh, were a privileged people. To be part of the visible church of God carries with it privileges. Uh, if you think about those who belong to that first or who are part of that first census, uh, they enjoyed a rich spiritual heritage. Uh, they were the natural descendants of Abraham. Uh, they were natural descendants of Abraham to whom belong the covenant promises of God. And it was to their father Abraham that the Lord had promised in Genesis 17 and verse 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And indeed, that promise of God to uh, Abraham at that time was, furthermore, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so all those who belong or were numbered in that first uh, census uh, were the natural descendants of Abraham and they all belonged uh, to the uh, covenant people of God of that day, or at least outwardly, they belonged to the covenant people of God of that day. It had been, of course, in faithfulness uh, to his promises, his covenant promises, the covenant promises made particularly to Abraham that God had brought that generation out of Egypt. It was in faithfulness to his covenant promises that the Lord had led that generation through the wilderness to the doorstep of Canaan. Now, that generation had been miraculously led, of course, by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And not only had the Lord led them, but he had also actually journeyed in the midst of them. Furthermore, we know from the account of the wilderness wanderings that he protected them, he fought for them, he provided for them all of their physical and material needs. He provided them with clothing and footwear that never disintegrated. He gave them manna from heaven. He provided water from the rock. Uh, he communicated with them on a consistent basis uh, through his servant Moses. Uh, he gave them his word. He gave them his law. Uh, that earlier generation uh, had, that was counted uh, uh, at Sinai uh, had enjoyed multiple blessings at the hand of the Lord. They enjoyed physical and spiritual blessings not dissimilar uh, to those that each of us enjoy as members of the visible church today. Remember, remember also that that generation numbered at Sinai have been pri privileged to observe many of the mighty works of the Lord as well. Uh, just think what they'd seen. Uh, they'd come out of Egypt and then they'd had the opportunity to observe uh, the crossing of the Red Sea. They'd seen the Red Sea parted. They'd seen the children of Israel cross the Red Sea on dry ground. They'd witnessed also the destruction of the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Uh, they'd been there at Marah uh, when the Lord had made the bitter waters sweet. They'd also witnessed the victory that the Lord had given to the children of Israel over the Amalekites at Rephidim. Uh, they had been those who had actually eaten the manna that had come down from heaven. They'd drunk of the water that had flowed from the rock. And furthermore, that generation had also been given to see something of the character of God. They saw the thunderings and the lightnings at Sinai, thunderings and lightnings which testified of the righteousness and holiness of God. 
Furthermore, they understood that the Lord could not be approached by sinful men, but moreover, they had observed firsthand the mercy and grace of God. Just think of it, how many times had that generation uh, had Moses and Aaron to seed on their behalf when uh, they had in fact rebelled against the things of God? On how many occasions had that generation complained and chided the Lord over his dealings with them? On how many occasions had the Lord on uh, at, at the behest of Moses uh, bestowed mercy and grace uh, when he ought to have destroyed that generation? The generation numbered at the first census also had the privilege of sitting under the instruction of Moses and Aaron. Moreover, they were instructed through the types and the shadows of the tabernacle worship. Uh, through those types and shadows, they were taught about sin and the consequences of sin. They were pointed to the need for repentance and faith. They were taught how that their sins needed to be forgiven and they needed to be reconciled to a righteous and holy God. That generation were also taught about the necessity of sins being forgiven and the need to be reconciled with God. They were taught about the necessity for blood to be shed in order there should be atonement for sin. They were taught of the need for an unblemished, spotless sacrifice. So through the, through the types and the shadows, uh, that generation were pointed consistently to the way of salvation. Uh, one might say that they had Jesus Christ and his righteousness set before them in the types and the shadows. Sermon upon sermon. Lesson upon lesson, day after day, month after month, year after year, uh, they had they were taught the way of God. Now here's the point. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding all those privileges, notwithstanding all of those physical and spiritual blessings, not one of those numbered at that first census. Not one of those 600,000 plus men were counted in the second census. Every last one of them, every last one of those 600,000 plus men perished in the wilderness. Without exception, they failed to enter into the rest of Canaan and they were cut off from the promised land. It was not simply that they died prior to their entrance into Canaan, but the point here was that the Lord actually prevented them from entering into Canaan. The Lord ensured that they did not enter into the promised land. And as a consequence, they failed to receive the blessings of the Lord and the promises concerning the land of Canaan itself. Their deaths in the wilderness was the doing of the Lord. Now, not all died as did the 24,000 on the plains of Moab under the direct judgment of the Lord. Many, in fact, died in the wilderness of natural causes, but all died under the judgment and the wrath of God. The nature of the death of many of those men also indicated that they perished not only physically, but they perished also eternally. They received no interest in the earthly canon but more significantly, they also received no interest in the heavenly Canaan. They died, one might say, without a living faith in Jesus Christ. They had no part in either the earthly or heavenly Canaan. You see, the majority of those that perished in the wilderness and were not the true sons of Abraham. They were the natural descendants of Abraham they had a place outwardly, at least amongst the children of God. They were part of the visible church of that day, but they were not Abraham's true spiritual seed. That's not to suggest that there were no exceptions. Uh, there were some exceptions among those that died in the wilderness. Uh, there were some who died in the wilderness who actually were the true spiritual seed of Abraham. Uh, you find that confirmed in Hebrews chapter 3 
in verse 16. In Hebrews 3.16, you read, For some, when they had heard, did provoke. But then the writer of the Hebrews goes on to say, Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. In other words, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses provoked uh, the Lord. But that does not take away from the fact that the generation, that that generation numbered at the first census, viewed as a whole, failed to enter into the spiritual rest of Canaan and so also failed to enter into the spiritual rest of the heavenly Canaan of which the earthly Canaan was but a type or picture. The vast majority of that generation died in the wilderness and they died in the wilderness. Why? They died in the wilderness on account of their unbelief. Uh, they died uh, in the wilderness because they did not believe uh, the promises of God. Uh, brethren, we ought to remind ourselves of that. They died because of their unbelief. Uh, that generation looked to their own wisdom and to their own strength. Uh, they preferred the word of the ten spies uh, to the words of Joshua and Caleb. It was as though they looked at those reports and they preferred the report of the ten spies and they said to themselves, uh, looking to their own strength and out of fear, we can't do it, we can't do it. It's impossible for us to take the land of Canaan. There are giants in the land. And so that generation refused to trust in the Lord and his promises. That's also confirmed in Hebrews chapter 3 in the verses 17 through 19 where we read, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear that, he should, that they should not enter into his rest? But notice this, but to them that believed not, so we see, says the writer of Hebrews, that they could not enter in because of unbelief. On account of their unbelief, on account of their failure to trust the Lord, that generation, that generation was justly excluded from the promised land. Now, brethren, we should not miss, we should not miss the similarities between ourselves and the generation that perished in the wilderness. Like them, we are journeying through the wilderness of this world. We're journeying through the wilderness of this world uh, by God's grace on our way to the heavenly Canaan. At least that's what we profess. That's what we say uh, we are doing. Uh, that's what we hope that we are doing. The disturbing fact is that we have many things in common, however, with the generation that perished in the wilderness. Like them, we are numbered among the people of God. We live within the midst of the visible church. Indeed, many of us have been raised within the visible church, as indeed were they. And many, if not all of us, bear the sign and seal of the covenant of grace, in our case, the uh, sign and seal of baptism, in their case, the sign and seal of circumcision. And many of us uh, have openly professed faith in Jesus Christ. We identify ourselves with the people of God. We declare ourselves to be Christians. And we are well aware of the promise of an eternal inheritance in the heavenly Canaan. Uh, we have been supplied with spiritual manna. We've eaten of the real bread from heaven. We've had the opportunity to drink the refreshing water from the spiritual rock. The Lord speaks to us by his word. Indeed, we have his word in our possession. Uh, we have been instructed in spiritual things. Uh, we, like that unbelieving generation, have been taught about the nature and character of God. Uh, we are aware that God is a righteous and holy God. Uh, we know that 
as such, he cannot and will not look upon sin. And furthermore, we know that we are sinners. We've been taught that we are sinners. And we know, therefore, that we stand in need of atonement being made for our sins. We also need know the need that we have to be reconciled to God if we would enjoy a relationship with him. We also know that the only way of forgiveness and reconciliation is in and through Jesus Christ. We've been taught those things. Uh, we've heard those things time and time again. We've been taught those things in many instances by our parents. We've been taught those things through the preaching of the word of God, Lord's Day by Lord's Day. We know of the cross. We know of the significance of the cross. We know of the work of Jesus Christ. We know of our need of him. We know of the need that we have for our sins to be forgiven, for the guilt of our sins to be removed. Just as was the case with the first generation, we have been taught those things, sermon after sermon, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, month after month, year after year. But when you think about it, you know, we actually enjoy even greater privileges than did those 600,000 plus men that perished in the wilderness now, they lived in the days of the types and the shadows uh, when the way of salvation was not fully unfolded, when the gospel was somewhat indistinct, shadowy types and figures for a shadowy age. Whereas we are the beneficiaries of a much greater spiritual clarity and understanding, Jesus Christ having come and fulfilled all of the types and the shadows, Living in the New Testament age, we have the privileges uh, that that uh, generation that died in the wilderness did not enjoy. We're able to look back at those events in the wilderness and we're able to look back at those events with some measure of clarity in light of the revelations that are given to us in the New Testament scriptures. But we are those who live in an age that uh, follows the coming of Jesus Christ. We're not looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ has come. Uh, we, we have his word. Uh, he speaks to us uh, through uh, the gospel writers. Whether in light of the fact that so many of the children of Israel failed to enter into Canaan, in fact, died outside of Jesus Christ, the question naturally raised by our text for our consideration is what of us? What of us? Do we, are we assured of a place in the kingdom of God? Will we have an inheritance in the heavenly Canaan? Will you, will I be numbered among the people of God at the final census? Or will we, like that first generation, perish in the wilderness of this world? As was evident, to be numbered in the first census was not enough. It's not enough. It will not suffice simply to rely upon our place in the visible church to say that we are numbered among those who make up the visible church, it won't be enough to have attempted or rather attended regularly at church, nor will it be enough to point to our baptism and our place in the outward administration of the covenant, nor will it even suffice to have made a public profession of faith All those things are right and good. But the generation that perished in the wilderness uh, could have made essentially those same claims. Entrance into the heavenly Canaan can only be attained by faith 
in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only way into the heavenly Canaan. That's what Peter declares in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 when he says, Neither is there salvation in any other. Speaking there, of course, about Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. To enter the heavenly Canaan, you and I must have a living faith in Jesus Christ. We must believe in him. We must look to him for our salvation. We must believe in him as the fulfilment of God's covenant promises. We must trust him. We must trust his assurances. We must believe that he died upon the cross of Calvary for our sins. Now, in order to do that, uh, the Spirit of God must dwell in our hearts. That's not our doing. Our salvation is all of grace. That's the testimony of Paul, of course, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Brethren, it's only by way of a living faith in Jesus Christ that you and I will ever enter into the heavenly Canaan. What this passage makes plain to us is this Mem membership in the visible church is not enough. Connection to the visible church is not enough. The book of Numbers provides over 600,000 examples that confirm that membership in the visible church is not enough. Note again, there was not a man of them, not a man of them, whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. Not one of them was numbered in the second census. Given that so many have failed to enter into their rest in Canaan, and the question might be asked, was the Lord unfaithful with respect to that first generation? Given that so many among the children of Israel perished in unbelief, did that mean that the grace of God had become of none effect? Had the covenant promises of God failed? Was it the Lord had initially purposed to save this people but found their rebellion to be so great that he was forced to step back from his promises? Had not the Lord promised that the children of Israel would inherit Canaan and yet that first generation viewed as a whole failed to enter into their rest? What of God's promises? What of those promises in Genesis 17? You might uh, recognise that the questions that I've been positing to you have uh, quite a measure of similarity to some of the questions that Paul actually canvasses in uh, Romans, particularly in Romans chapter 9. There in Romans, uh, Paul asks, has God cast away his people? Many answer that question in the affirmative. Yes, God did cast away his people, they say. He cast them away, they say, for good reason. They rebelled and failed to manifest the necessary faith, faith being the contribution required of men and women, faith being that which we contribute to our own salvation. Salvation, in fact, being conditioned upon our faith, conditioned upon our believing and upon our trusting in Jesus Christ. Faith as a condition of salvation is said to be exemplified in the history of the children of Israel. and The failure to fulfil that condition is said to be the explanation as to why so many fail to enter into the promised land. Between the two numberings, many failed to persevere as a result of their unbelief were excluded from Canaan. 
At Sinai, so it's contended, the Lord intended to bring all of the people into the promised land and to give them their inheritance. Indeed, he desired, so it's suggested, to bring all of them into that inheritance. But his desire was thwarted by their rebellion and unbelief. So that God's promise became of none effect, God abandoning many whom he had originally purposed to save. Now, brethren, understand this. Uh, Such suggestions, such contentions are absolutely contrary to Scripture and are a a refutation of the sovereignty of God. The promises of God uh, did not fail. Uh, God did not intend uh, to save all of the children of Israel head for head. You need to understand that faith is a gift of God. It is God who enables you and me to believe. Because of the fall and the corruption of our nature, we cannot indeed, uh, we will not believe in Jesus Christ. We refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. We have no capacity, no inclination to believe in Jesus Christ in and of our souls. As a result of the fall, all mankind became totally depraved. As a consequence, mankind is not able to generate faith within themselves. Faith is not something that any of us can whip up or cultivate within ourselves. Faith is a gift of God. And the Lord gifts faith to whom he wills. God is sovereign, absolutely sovereign in salvation. He saves those whom he purposes to save. That's what he declared actually to Moses at Mount Sinai in Exodus 33, where he says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. That's the words, of course, that Paul picks up in Romans chapter 9. The reality, brethren, is that God's grace and mercy does not extend to all. It was never the Lord's intention to save all of the children of Israel that came out of Egypt. Nonetheless, the Lord was true to his promises. All whom the Lord purposed to save entered into the heavenly Canaan, even though they did not actually enter into the earthly Canaan. It's interesting to consider that. Not not all that came out of Egypt actually entered into the earthly Canaan. If you think about some of the examples, Moses didn't enter into the earthly Canaan. Aaron did not enter into the earthly Canaan. Uh, Zelophehad, uh, who you read about in Numbers 27, Uh, Also a child of God did not enter into uh, the earthly Canaan. But did those uh, ones have a place in the heavenly Canaan? Absolutely they did. Uh, They they were the true children of God. None of God's elect perished eternally in the wilderness. Through the wanderings in the wilderness, God was actually saving his church. Interestingly, the numbers recorded at the two censuses were nearly equal. As we noted at the outset of the sermon, the difference between the two censuses was only 1,820 souls. And many died in the wilderness Uh, the church of God was not destroyed. The true Israel of God was not consumed. Through the difficulties and trials of the wilderness, the Lord brought his church in the Old Testament to her promised rest in the land of Canaan. What occurred in the wilderness was a process of purification. 
And through that process, the church uh, was preserved. The final census, the census that will be taken at the day of Jesus Christ's return, will reveal that not one of those entrusted to the Son by the Father in eternity has been lost. Their names, the names of everyone entrusted by the Father to the Son has been written from eternity in the Lamb's Book of Life. Recall our Lord's high priestly prayer in John 17 and verse 12. He says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. The true church of Jesus Christ will be saved. None will be missing at the final census. The Israel of God will be brought to her complete and per perfect rest in the heavenly Canaan. Brethren, will we, will you, be counted in that final census? You cannot be assured, as we've said, of being counted in that final census on the basis of of your name being on a church membership role. But you can be assured of that, that your name will be on that role as you look to Jesus Christ and to him alone for your salvation. Brethren, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. Let's uh, stand for a brief word of prayer. Lord, let us not take uh, comfort in the external things of this world as regards our salvation as our place as regards our place with thee in glory uh, membership in the church even a public profession of our faith even a, an ability to articulate a doctrine uh, plainly and clearly uh, though, though those things in and of themselves uh, are desirable yet they're not the foundation or the basis upon which we will ever have a place with thee in glory. What we need is that we have a knowledge, a personal knowledge, a living knowledge, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and that uh, he is not just a saviour, but that actually he is our saviour, that we trust him, we trust him with our life, we trust him uh, in terms of our salvation, that in him our sins are covered, in him our sins are forgiven, in him our guilt is removed. Uh, Lord, uh, make Jesus Christ uh, to be the focal point of our life and the uh, one to whom we look for our salvation. Lord, open our eyes to those spiritual realities and work in our hearts. These things we pray for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.